A good workflow depends on automating whatever you can and making it easy for yourself. Elementor's global settings are there for that exact reason. But global fonts, typography, what's the difference? Which settings should you set up and which ones can you ignore? Let's break down Elementor's global settings and figure out how you can and should use them to make your work easier. Now before we do anything, make sure you go into your dashboard, go under Elementor, Settings and make sure Disable Default Colors and Disable Default Fonts is unchecked. Once you're on your page, click this over here, this hamburger icon and let's go into Site Settings. Let us start with the easiest thing, Colors. Now global colors are pretty self-explanatory. These are colors you can reuse on your website with just one click and if you change a global color, it's gonna change anywhere it's applied. Really useful and really powerful stuff. I really recommend you set these up, whichever colors you're gonna be using, add them in here, you can rename them. And as you're working, if you add in a new color, you can just press this little plus over here and create a global color right away. So besides that, the only thing we need to go through is which widgets, which elements these global colors apply to by default. Now here's a full list of which color is gonna be applied where by default. Just take a look at it, pause the video if you need to, and it will all make sense. Any of these can bother you if you set them wrong, but since you'll like be using text editors and headings the most, I recommend you set your text color and your primary color to the colors you want your, well, text and headings to be. And of course with the global colors you can add in your own colors, that's the beauty of this, you can have as many colors as you need to. Moving on, let's talk about the difference between global fonts and typography. This is probably the most confusing part, but it's quite simple. For fonts you plan to use and reuse, just like the global colors, you're gonna use global fonts. So here is where you set up your heading fonts, your subheadings, your body font, anything you plan on using throughout your website, set it up here. All of the sizes, the font families, the line heights, global fonts is where you do it. Make sure you name them so you know what you're working with. The most disruptive if you get it wrong is the text font. Make sure you set this up to whatever you want your body font to be. Speaking of body fonts, I have a video explaining how to choose a good body font for your website. The link is in the description. Just keep in mind that to make them responsive, you have to do it the same way as everything else. Go into responsive mode, enter your tablet or mobile mode and change what you want to change. And if you do nothing else to these, at least set all of the font families. This is gonna make sure you're using the correct fonts throughout your website, no matter the widget. It's gonna prevent widgets using the default fonts. So definitely at least set the fonts to whichever font you'll be using, even if you don't do anything to the size, weight, line height, and so on. Now with the typography, you're gonna see these headings over here, H1, H2, H3, and so on. These are HTML, H tags, and their primary purpose, or really the only purpose, is S. SEO. These tags essentially tell search engines what your website is about, how it's structured, and they let you define what the most important text is for search engines. They have nothing to do with the styling or the size of your text, your headings. H1 is the most important one, it should represent the main subject of your whole page and you should only use one H1 tag per page. H2 is the second most important, H3 the third and so on. But that does not mean that visually the H1 tag has to be attached to the biggest heading. Because the purpose of HTML heading tags is SEO, you should use the more important H tags for things that are going to help you rank high in Google. And those things are not necessarily things you want your users to see first. Let's take my website as an example. The first thing users see is my slogan, design and development worthy of royalty. It's a big title, but it's not my H1 tag or even my H2. That's because this would not help me rank high in Google. Google. Now let's take a look at my actual H1, which is this. I'm specialized in branding, website design and development, e-commerce and website maintenance, which is quite a boring title and it's definitely not as unique as my slogan. It is not very memorable and it doesn't set me apart from the competition, but it is good for SEO. It accurately tells search engines what this page is about. But since it isn't that interesting for the user, it's much, much smaller than design and development worthy of royalty. And it's also way lower down while my slogan is the first thing users C. So using the proper H tags and styling your titles is very much about finding a balance between how your users read your website and how search engines read your website. When you add in a heading, you can give it the appropriate tag over here. And then you can use whichever global font you set to control the style. And that's how you can set everything up with just a couple of clicks 
and you have full control over the SEO and the appearance. So the only thing I would recommend you change under typography are settings for links. And even then, I only change the colors. If you use a text editor and add in a link, this is the styling that's going to be applied. Change the colors of this, but leave everything else alone. Moving on to buttons, you can set the default button over here. Not much else that needs to be set here. I personally do not use this much, but if you want to, go ahead. For these less common elements, I usually just copy and paste the style from one I already created. Same thing for the images, but this can be great for things like border radiuses. If you want all of your images to have a border radius, you can make sure they have one by default by setting it up here. Form fields, same thing. So buttons, images and form fields, you can pretty much ignore these and not feel bad about it. When it comes to the header and the footer, I never use these. I always make my headers and footers from scratch by using the theme builder. So these will not even apply to my headers or footers. I would recommend you create your own headers and footers as well. It's much more personalized. You can do anything with it. It's going to fit the whole design better. So these settings really do not matter. And for the site logo and tagline, it tells you to go into your site identity. So just set your site name, your description, your logo and your favicon. The favicon is the little icon that shows up in the browser tab. Then for the background, I do not use this either because I usually want the default to be white and then I control everything via my global colors. But if you want your default website background to be something other than white, just change it here. Another thing I do recommend you set up is under layout. I always adjust the content width because the default 1140 pixels is a little bit cramped in my opinion, so I make it a little bit bigger. This just means that when you add in a container, when it's set to boxed by default, this is how wide it's going to be. You can always override any of these global settings. The whole point is that it just makes work easier and faster. You can also control how much padding the container has by default. If you want to know more about how I set up my paddings and the units I use and why, I have a great video on units in Elementor. So check that out. The link is in the description. Again, this is a great little feature because chances are you do not want your paddings to just be 10 pixels on every container by default. You can disable the default padding entirely by setting it to zero. The same thing goes for the gap between elements. This applies to your containers over here. So the gap between elements controls how far apart widgets in your container are, including, of course, nested containers. By default, it's 20 pixels, and I recommend you use percent, REM, or pixels when setting this gap. I like to set it to 2 or 2.5 REM. The rest of the settings I leave as is. The default page layout is theme. If you set it to Elementor Canvas, it's going to not display your header or your footer. But since I usually want them to be displayed, and you probably do as well, just keep this as is. And if you don't want to display them on certain pages, you can easily just go into that page, go into settings and change the page layout to whatever you want. And make sure both the padding and the space between elements are set up to be responsive as well if you need them to be. Now under breakpoints, you can add in more breakpoints, which you can then use to style your elements more responsively. So if you want an extra breakpoint for your desktop, if your website just isn't looking right at around, let's say between 1024 and 1400 pixels, you can do so here and then style your elements separately for devices between 1024, which is the tablet mode, and 1400 pixels. I usually stick to the main three because it's kind of a rabbit hole. Perfect responsiveness doesn't exist, which is why using responsive units is so important. If I ever have a situation where something just doesn't work well, I usually use CSS media queries to adjust it just a little bit, just like my header over here. You can see how it jumps to full width as I make the window smaller, even though this is all still on desktop. But if you don't want to use CSS, you can achieve the same thing by using these breakpoints. Just do not go too crazy. Try to make as much as you can work with just the default three. The rest of the settings are pretty much on a need to use basis and would not make much sense for me to include in this general tutorial, so I won't. I do not really use them, but you can set your page transitions and preloaders over here. And when it comes to custom CSS, I prefer adding it directly into my admin bar under customize and then additional CSS. If this video was helpful, check out this video next and make sure you hit that thumbs up button. Thank you for watching.